So why are ecosystems a thing now that everyone is speaking about? There's three different changes that are all coming together and leading business ecosystems to be the next big thing. The first thing, which has been happening for a while, is that we see the crumbling of the existing rigid structures in either professions or in what firms do. For a very long time, we used to have a society based on exclusion. You used to have guilds, only some things that lawyers or architects or shoemakers do, and we gave them some privileges in exchange with them not totally messing everything up. Society then started saying, well, hang on a minute, that's not the best way in which I can organize things. Perhaps what I can do is I can allow for a lot of experimentation. So the world today is fundamentally different from what we had 10, 20, 30 years ago. Consider what's happening in financial services. We used to have regulators like the Bank of England and later the FCA that was trying to say, this is the strict province of what banks do. I'm going to tell you what their activities are. Please don't enter unless you ask me and so on and so forth. Right now, if you go to the FCA, there is something called a regulatory sandbox, like the little sandboxes that kids play. Why? Because we want to try out new things. Because regulation has shifted and from focusing on exclusion, they're focusing on experimentation. That's the first big change. The second big change is digitization. We used to need to be collocated because we need to pass work around, whether it is physical or whether it is in an office. And as we had digitization, we just realized that people can be in different offices, in different cities, in different countries, in different companies. So you have the possibility of slicing and dicing things around. And at the same time, you have a reduction at the cost of moving things around or storing information. The third thing, which sounds key here, is what's called modularization. What does that mean? Well, as we started playing with these new technologies, we realized that there is the possibility of creating things that will be on different modules. Think about what IBM did with System 360. They said, look, I'm not going to have this big thing where I'm going to write it all in an integral problem. I'm going to have an operating system. Uh, that sits on top of BIOS, and on top of it will have a graphical user interface, and on top of it I'm going to have software so that each one can do their stuff separately, and they don't need to bother about each other. That said, there is someone who needs to manage these interdependencies, needs to take it from one iteration to the next, needs to think about this whole thing working. And as more and more technologies became modular, as more and more ways of producing stuff became modular, we then created the possibility of having the orchestrator that organizes all the interdependencies and the people that provide each of the modules. So if you put all of these together, the possibility of having this soup of different things, the possibility of moving them around, which digitization brings, the possibility of modularizing, you see why ecosystems are becoming a thing and they are becoming the way in which value is produced and value is distributed, which is why seven out of the world's top biggest firms in terms of market capitalization are the ecosystem orchestrators that are changing entire industries day by day. How are ecosystems structured is something that is still not defined. Why? Because our regulatory apparatus, the tools with which we decide what works and what doesn't, what the law allows us or not, is still focused on one market at a time. That's a very big problem. Because if we think, for instance, about Amazon, Amazon is deriving its power by being at the hub of a powerful ecosystem. Now, Amazon's defense is, don't look at me, I'm doing good things. Retail is becoming cheaper. Now, this is missing the point because Amazon's power is precisely that it is making retail so cheap, but that it is creating other organizations that critically depend on it and that it is taking a big cut of their business. Unfortunately, mainstream economics that defines our antitrust um, way of looking at the world is not well suited for that. So we don't have ways of thinking about that other than a few exceptions. So what will happen? Will we come to a world where who is in and who is out will need to be rethought where the regulators may need to have a say on that? I think we will. We're not there yet because the discussion is not there yet. But hopefully 
in the next couple of years as we see these ecosystem orchestrators become stronger and stronger, we'll start asking some questions, not only about what will make them more profitable or make their complementers more profitable, but also on how equitably they're structured and what are the steps we can take to restore some greater amount of equity. The discussion around some of these ecosystems, I think, has focused on issues such as democracy or fake news, which are very important issues and we absolutely need to understand them. Partly because not only are they important in their own right, but they show the power of the orchestrator that is directing the customers and inadvertently, as far as the customer goes, or the voter or the citizen, they are shaping their views. On the other hand, that relates to polity. It does not relate to the way that they can benefit and profit from their complementers. And if you see what ecosystem strong players are doing, take Instagram, it creates a nice little club, 20 other firms, you can buy it from within the app. Why? Because it has your attention. And it wants to create a select set of relationships with which it can have a mutually beneficial relationship meaning other people can't be out. Is this a structure that we think should continue or not? I think these are questions we have not yet asked. And although we are now understanding that big tech is not only a force for good, and we understand that it has bright sides, but also dark sides, I think that we need to redefine our apparatus for thinking about market power and dominance. A number of these developments are important for insurers. First of all, what we see is the proliferation of new business models. Take what's happening in mobility. We are shifting from the traditional model of owning a car and then driving it, and the occasional rental car businesses that are separate, well-structured, by the way, both with very clear, deep, and well-ensconced markets, auto insurance and insurance for rental cars, and now we are moving to mobility as a service. Clearly, that creates a host of new needs. How will you start creating insurance for ride sharing? Whose responsibility is it? How can you protect different people who engage in something that they think is exciting, but they feel there is a real need? So as we see these new products that emerge as a result of these new ecosystems, we see the emergence of new products and new services and new ways of fulfilling that will also need new insurance. That's also going to give you new data because you have new types of things on which you cannot rely in an actuarial sense on a stack of existing information, but rather on a quickly adjusting set of experiments that give you some baseline that you need to evolve in order to make sure that this is both a viable business but also that it is sensibly priced. So I think that we will see a great new set of opportunities that will emerge in terms of the products. We will also see a challenge because we have a different set of requirements that are required for the insurers to be able to understand the data and project into the future. And I think that the growth of ecosystems is going to be challenging uh, the insurance players both for finding new ways of adding value and for thinking their product not only in its traditional narrow definition but also in embedding it in a broader set of things that the customer needs as well as adjusting the way that they are organized in order to be able to respond to the emerging challenges and use the data that exists in order to define their pricing at profitable levels. Access to data is extremely important. It is important first because having the data helps you understand where the needs are, what the needs are. Second, because access to data helps you understand the risk and what is the appropriate pricing for the risk. And it is not a coincidence that you see players that take the superior data that they have when they have an agreement to use it with the actors in order to offer insurance. Think about what's happening with Tesla, for instance, recently announced that by the end of this month, they're going to have insurance out. Why? Well, because you've signed, without really looking at it too carefully, this under the dotted line that you're fine to have all of the data 
freely downloaded from Tesla every time that you need an upgrade. Well, frankly, the real reason is that you are giving a mountain of data to Tesla in order to improve its autonomous driving, to understand the usage patterns of the cars, to figure out how it can improve the product, how it can improve the placement, how it can understand the customer, and coincidentally, whether people should pay a high or a low premium. Why should Tesla sit on this information and how can it, Tesla or any other firm with superior information, use it in order to create products that are both convenient for the customer, embedded in a nice package you don't have to think about, but also effective from an underwriting perspective because they take advantage of data that is recent and that is rich in terms of what the customer has. Or think about some of the big innovators in insurance. One of the names that came out of almost nowhere to become the most valuable brand in the planet, in the insurance industry, is Ping An. What is Ping An? Ping An is a Chinese company that does insurance, but it has used the access to the customers and the knowledge it has of the customers to create also all kinds of other services, including Good Doctor, which does two things. First, it adds value to Chinese people because it says, I'm going to use technology, which by the way I'm using for my core product, in order to make you healthier and this way I'm going to get a potential cut. But not only do I get a cut, I make sure that you're not sick and you don't die. And I'm insured and I like these two things because obviously they reduce my cost. They increase my profitability when I sell you life or health products. So you find ways of being able to combine them. Now the reason that that developed in China is, to be politically incorrect, there's very little concern about privacy in terms of China. Now when you do that you can shift data around and you're not going to ask too many questions and you are going to be able to experiment. So we will see some experimentation on the basis of data to be developed in countries that don't have any constraints. That's not terribly surprising. And we will see what the competition between European firms that need to deal with GDPR, American firms that will probably need to deal with some of the version of the California law that's going to go uh, through both houses soon enough, um, and Chinese firms that are using very aggressively AI as a tool to support the operation of their ecosystems. When thinking about ecosystems, we should not think about orchestrating one. One of the biggest challenges that not only insurers but any firms face is missing or mixing up a particular letter and focusing on the ego system, not the ecosystem thing that the rest of the world will revolve around them. That is a challenge because rather than thinking about how you can add value to the intermediate or the final customer, you just think about what you can offer presuming somewhat arrogantly that the rest of the world will come out there when you offer it to them. Now the problem is that ecosystems emerge in the first place because of the convenience, because of the value that you add to the customer. So you shouldn't just think that you are or you will be an uh, orchestrator, but you may want to participate in ecosystems and in different ecosystems and be the player that facilitates the operation of ecosystems by developing the skills to participate and ally, not only to orchestrate and manage. The challenge that exists is that the existing way in which things are organized in the insurance sector, whereby we know what the structure is, we know that there is an underwriting arm and then we know there are people that are dealing with claims and then we know what product development looks like which are discrete they haven't really changed that much although we've added a bit of technology it's fundamentally pretty much the same thing won't necessarily be needed now we've seen that already in insurance we have seen firms using their treasury as a substitute to insurance, sometimes even going directly either to catastrophe bonds or to reinsurers to support what they do. I think that this bypassing that had been an issue but not an overwhelming one for the industry for quite a few years is starting to be much more real as we see the possibility of finding new ways of having firms that are using things like 
their cash flow, their brand, their reputation, uh, and their oomph to create value and the feeling of security in ways that insurers were able to do in the past. But this is also the strategic gambit, and this is the challenge that exists for insurance. How can insurers remain more relevant in a world whereby you have greater competition for the way that you add value and that you cannot take for granted that it's only competition between different insurance firms, but it is part of a broader offering that is offered. So in a way, in a world of ecosystems, digital technology and AI, it comes down to managing to woo the customer and give them the sense that the feeling of security is valuable and finding ways of monetizing it. How quickly should we move? Well, there's a challenge here. And clearly, trying to run without a plan is simply going to lead to disaster. On the other hand, not moving, and this industry has had the privilege of not really being rocked for a while, has significant risks. I think that what needs to happen is for preparing the company and the industry for change. The reason is that when change happens, it does not happen slowly. Think about what's happened in financial services. Think about what's happened with automobiles. Nobody in the automobile sector would have thought that within five years, you would have mobility services being more valuable than the automobile makers themselves and the automobile sector makers from dismissing these small, irrelevant upsells like Grab and Uber would have been clamoring to give hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars in investments in order to participate. What I think needs to happen is the engagement of insurance companies in measured ways, not in ways that are crazy capital uh, allocations that show the market that we're doing something, but in measured ways in experiments where they're trying to figure out what customers need. Because you need to start developing both the skills and the knowledge and the muscle in order to respond. So I think that there needs to be proactive engagement. I think that change will happen in the medium term, not in the next six to 12 months, but in the next three to four years. But in order to be ready for that, I think that clear action, a specific unit, and some engagement of that unit with the rest of the body politic of the firm, bringing people from outside the sector as well that will help refresh the thinking and help make sure that we're not missing the boat.